Hi, I'm Mark Lynch, Director of the Project on Middle East Political Science and the Institute for Middle East Studies at George Washington University. Welcome to the first installment of our POMAPS Conversations, a series of conversations with leading scholars in the field. With us today is Tariq Massoud, Associate Professor in the John F. Kennedy School at Harvard University and author of a new book, Counting Islam, Religion, Class, and Elections in Egypt. Uh, welcome, Tariq. Well, thanks, Mark. So uh, I've just finished reading uh, your excellent book. And uh, you make some interesting arguments about why Egyptians vote for the Muslim Brothers, and you say that it doesn't actually have that much to do with Islam. So why do you think that? Right. Well, so this book is absolutely, as you said, it's a, it's the, you know, a friend of mine recently said that the title was sort of inscrutable, and I was like, no, it's about how much Islam counts, you know, in <laughs> in explaining the elect the tremendous electoral victories that the Muslim Brotherhood and the Salafi uh, parties achieved in Egypt's founding elections. And so basically what this book tries to argue based on a combination of uh, qualitative and quantitative evidence is in fact when Egyptians were going to the polls to vote for the Muslim Brotherhood and for Hezbi Nur, the Salafi party, they were not doing so because they wanted to enact a theocratic agenda. In fact, what they really cared about were the things that we heard as the slogans in Tahrir Square during the revolution that overthrew Mubarak. Aish, hurriya, adala, ijtima'iya, bread, freedom, and social justice. And the fact is that the Muslim Brotherhood was better able than its rivals, and the Islamists more broadly, were better able than their rivals to convince voters that they were actually going to address those issues. So for me, the real puzzle of this book is why that was. And why isn't it that, given that Egyptians really have this desire for what I think of as welfare statist and redistributive policies, they end up voting for the Islamists as opposed to for the leftists. And so that's the, the thing that I try to investigate in this book. And, and you, you make a very good case uh, for why the leftist parties in Egypt are so weak and why they're unable to make those appeals. Um, but at the same time, my understanding of the Muslim Brotherhood has always been that they've been more of like a free market. Uh, you know, a kind of a middle class party, and yet you argue that they've actually been able to, to capture that populist welfare state type of, of, of space. Yes, this is actually a really uh, important point because um, if you look at the Muslim Brotherhood's pol uh, economic discourse, say during, in the 1970s when Anwar Sadat the, the third president of Egypt was trying to move the country more into the Western orbit and liberalize its economy. The Muslim Brotherhood, which after all its cadres are sort of middle class people and businessmen, really appreciated that move. And so there's a lot of literature from that period where the Muslim Brotherhood very much articulates this kind of anti-statist agenda when it comes to the economy. But what we find is that as the Muslim Brotherhood participated in politics, even during the Mubarak era, they realized that Egyptians are leftists. <laughs> Egyptians don't like privatization, for example. So if you look at the 2010 uh, Muslim Brotherhood electoral uh, platform in the last elections of Mubarak, the Muslim Brotherhood take credit for stopping the train of privatization in Egypt, right? Because they understood that that's where Egyptians were. And so it's kind of nice evidence on this question of do Islamists adapt when they come into democratic politics, clearly on this issue they did. But you're absolutely right, Mark, that they were still nowhere near where a party like Hezb et the major right. leftist party, was on these issues of redistribution and shoring up the welfare state. And so again, this is the puzzle, right? Why are why wasn't Hezb et able to attract voters? And you know, we have all kinds of arguments. Secretary Clinton, in her new book talks about how the Egyptian opposition were completely um, you know, feckless and they, they just weren't organized. And the Muslim Brotherhood and the Islamists were organized. And I thought, that can't, that can't be the answer, right? Like the, the idea that political parties should organize, it's not an earth shattering idea. Like clearly the leftists are smart enough to get this. So what it comes down to in my view is that the, the Muslim Brotherhood and the, the Salafi parties had an inborn advantage, which is that Egypt has a lot of mosques, religious institutions. It's just the, the nature of public life has a serious religious component that Islamists could use to reach people. Leftist parties, which we know all over the world rely on labor unions, well, what did you have in Egypt? You don't really have a very strong labor union sector. So if I'm a leftist political activist, how, and I want to tell Egyptian voters, hey, listen, I, I want to redistribute to you. Where am I going to tell them this? How am I going to encounter them? 
And so that's really what it comes down to. And, and so in a way, this book, it's as much about leftists as it is about right. Islamists. And it comes to offer, I think, a measure of redemption for uh, the Egyptian left, at least in, in terms of why they didn't perform so well. What's interesting, though, is that you also uh, spend a whole chapter uh, trying to uh, debunk the idea that this is about their social services and the clinics and the hospitals. But you have a very, very interesting take on how they, what, how they do benefit from it. Yes, yes. Well, so, so the book, the book sort of started its life, as, as you know better than anybody, as a, a dissertation on the Muslim Brotherhood, not on Islamist more broadly, Muslim Brotherhood in authoritarian elections. And now the book is a much bigger book. Uh, um, but so one of the... Th one th th things happened. Yeah, things happened, uh, you know. So, but the point of, of this is, so I do have a chapter early on where I'm trying to explain how is it that the Muslim Brotherhood emerged as the principal elected opposition to Mubarak, right? Because the story of Islamist dominance goes all the way back to, you know, the Mubarak period. And so there the, the standard answer was they're providing services to the masses. That is clearly why they are winning. And for me, that seemed to neglect the fact, at least when we talk about the authoritarian period, it seemed to neglect the fact that the regime was really putting a lot of pressure on Islamist clinics and Islamist organizations, really making it very difficult for them to deploy religious institutions to the kind of clientelistic right. vote buying purposes that people said. So in fact, there's all kinds of testimony that I try to, adu uh, to, to, to show in this book of Islamists saying, look, you know, we did provide social services, but we had to be really careful. And you know, many of the, our social service partners would say, don't talk about politics. And so I'd say during the Mubarak period, the social service provision actually plays a very limited role in terms of actually generating votes. It does, however, generate a, a good reputation for them among the middle class voters who during the Mubarak period were actually free to kind of go and vote for the Muslim Brotherhood when they wanted to throw a stone at the regime. It's only later, after the democratic floodgates are open, that you know, all parties now are trying to find ways to reach voters, trying to find ways to buy votes, and the Islamists now have this fund of linkages that they can use to provide bags of sugar and, and talk to people, right? whereas the leftists just don't have anything equivalent. So the, the book is brand new and just came out, but still, I mean, it ends uh, yes. kind of before kind of the, the current situation. What are, your, what are your thoughts now on where the Muslim Brotherhood is after a year, uh, after, the, after the, the, the coup and after yeah. the, the repression and the shattering of the organization? Yeah. And you know, wh what, what is the Muslim Brotherhood now in yeah. terms of Egyptian politics and in terms of what it once was? This is, this is a great question. So, um, you know, Clearly, the Muslim Brotherhood has lost a huge amount of support in Egypt. We saw that in the diminution of their vote shares over time. We saw it in the millions of people who came out to protest against the Muslim Brotherhood in June of 2013. Not 33 million, as the Egyptians say, but a lot. Um, so clearly, they're not as popular as they once were. At the same time, you know, I've done a couple of surveys in Egypt following up since then, and the Muslim Brotherhood does retain a kind of core of support you know, about 10, 15 percent, depending on which, when you do the survey, that signals to me that the Muslim Brotherhood and Islamists more broadly are still, there's still a constituency for what they were selling. Um, so so on, the, on the sort of public side, there's still, there's still a demand. In terms of the organization itself, as you know, right, the, many of the senior leaders of the Muslim Brotherhood are in prison. And so the people uh, who are not in prison tend to be young people who are very emotionally uh, 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 invested in the idea of returning Mohammed Morsi to power, very emotionally invested in the idea of avenging the deaths of the more than 1,000 members of the Muslim Brotherhood who were killed in August of 2013 when the regime cleared the Rabah Square in Cairo. Um, and so for them, uh, you, you're starting to see a kind of turn to confrontation, a turn to violence, acts of sabotage, and ironically, and I was talking about this with the scholar Khalil Anani, ironically, uh, the people in the Brotherhood, as you know, who are sort of most anti-violence are the senior leaders, and they're the guys who are in jail and not really being able to communicate with the, the young people on the street. So I think the Muslim Brotherhood is in a very difficult position organizationally. Now there are, of course, talks that the regime wants to or is making noises about some kind of reconciliation with the Brotherhood, maybe releasing senior leaders. Helmi al-Ghazar, a leader from uh, Giza, was just released. Apparently, they're talking about releasing the former general guide, Mahdi Haqif. 
what would a reconciliation of the senior leaders with the regime do for all these young people who think that this regime is not to be reconciled with? So it's very difficult for the Muslim Brotherhood going forward. I think this is probably the most difficult uh, period in their history. Yeah, clearly. Um, does this create a new opening for the left? If, uh, if the left used to have this, uh, the ideas, but they couldn't find a place in society to articulate them. We saw Hamdin Sabahi running for president and doing spectacularly well. Yes. Um, uh, he won uh, several votes. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Um, <laughs> so, but, but, but for your argument, though, there should be a place now for someone to articulate the kind of populist yes. economic policies that Egyptians yes. like, yes. and they don't have the Islamists in their way. Yes. So what does your theory predict? So this is actually a great, I'm really glad that you ended on this note, because I actually think that though the book does try to offer some redemption to the left, it's also kind of a council of despair. <laughs> because, you know, look, what I'm saying fundamentally, it's, it's about linkages to voters. And, you know, bi you know, leftist parties are built on organizational infrastructures like labor unions. And the fact is, Egypt is a highly agrarian society with something like 60% of the workforce in the informal sector, 40 to 60%, uh, depending on, on who you look at. Ellis Goldberg tells me that, tells me that it's 40% because everything we don't know in Egypt has to be 40%. 40 <laughs> That's right. The, the military share of the, the economy. The military share of the economy. The Muslim Brotherhood's vote share. The informal <laughs> economy. That, yes, yes. Right. So, anyway. But, 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 but Joel, Joel Biden, I think, has a good, good article sort of trying to fix the, the percentage in the informal workforce. But what we know is basically, so you don't have this kind of industrialized workforce that is the core, that could be the backbone of a strong labor union movement that could then be the strong backbone of a left, of, of left programmatic leftist parties as we understand them. You can, as you noted, get sort of individual politicians who are kind of populist and use populist discourse. Interesting thing about Hamdin Sabahi, who you mentioned, the Egyptian leftist, uh, uh, Nasserist politician who uh, did pretty well in the uh, in the 2012 elections. Came in number three. Where did he get his most votes? It was in Kafr Sheikh, which is where he's from. So, and, and which I talk a, a little bit about in the book. So he was able to deploy obviously his personal networks, his reputation. So that kind of. Uh, you know, uh, big wig politics, local notable politics yeah. w will definitely be there and there will definitely be some, some populist discourse. But the kind of political parties that pursue a program of redistribution and shoring up the welfare state, the kinds of things that we associate with the left, I think is still going to be a long so way. So do you, do you see uh, General or President Assisi Restabilizing the regime back into kind of a late Mubarak style of semi authoritarianism with elections that do certain things? Or do you see this as a fundamental disrupture with the way Egyptian politics works? That is, that, it's too early to tell. I think, I think if we were to inject Abdel Fattah Sisi with sodium pentothal, he would love to bring Egypt back to a period of, you know, popular apathy with the political process, stabilize the, the sort of situation, get some tourism back, it's like restore the Mubarak status right. quo. Um, will he be able to do that? I'm not sure. You know, so I tend to be pretty pessimistic and I think Egypt is now worse off than it was under Mubarak. But when I talk to young people, for example, who are activists in some of the Ashwa'iyat, the informal communities, they tell me, watch out. There is a big change that's going to happen in Egypt because there is a, a group in that society that we haven't heard from, which are the poor and the downtrodden, and life is getting worse and worse and worse for them every day. So no matter what the designs are of Abdel Fattah Assisi, President Assisi, or anybody else, there is something brewing in Egyptian society that w may confound their uh, desire to get back to what you had under Mubarak. All right. Well, thank you, Tarek Masood, uh, Kennedy School, Harvard University, and the author of Counting Islam, Religion, Class, and Elections in Egypt. Thanks, Tarek. Thank you.